Hello Bournemouth fans, hope you're doing well, start of a new week, but sadly it's the same old story at the weekend as Cherries went out of the FA Cup, this time 4-2 uh, home, Burnley fully deserved the win, but on this show we're going to chew the fat over that game and the wider picture in general. My name's Sam Davis. My name's Tom Jordan. We're here at the Pair at Parley, thanks to Sam at the Pair for putting us up, we're in one of their amazing woodland dining huts, we're not on a sauna, people think me and you are... Yeah. Sauna and uh, together. So, yeah. I mean, let's not say we haven't. We're close, yeah. but... It does know. look a bit saunery. You know, I yeah, get that. It does, it's a bit but... of a vibe, very wood vibe. But no, lovely in here, and cheers to Sam and the pair for, for letting us come in and record. Yeah, if you want to hire one of these for your private party or function, then uh, get in touch with the pair at Parley, theparatparley.com, or give them a call. All the details are in the description below. Great food, great company, great drinks. You know where it's at. Where it wasn't at, Tom, yeah. was at Dean Court on Saturday in... A really, really lacklustre performance that uh, is perhaps not surprising based on our form since we've returned from the World Cup. It was, it was a really disappointing showing. And it was one of those games where I thought this could be ideal to get some momentum ahead of a much more important game against Brentford that's coming up. But yeah. we certainly didn't do that, did we? No, and I think before the game when you saw the lineups as well, you saw how strong we went. I think we said kind of in, in the game that apart from Lerma, really, it was very, you know, very full strength nearly. And... Mm. Yeah, and, and then you looked at theirs and they made a few changes, but it, it's, it's not that much of a surprise seeing, as you say, our form, but also Burnley's. I mean, Burnley are on fire and they look like, I mean, we didn't help, but they look like a mid-table Premier League side. I thought, you know, they before we get into it, I think you've got to say that, that Burnley look good and the way companies kind of managed to change the way they play yeah, that great. quickly is very impressive. And that was my concern, is we went pretty full strength. I looked at their wingers and thought they're better than ours, and, and things like that, it was a bit of a worry. But um, yeah, it wasn't a huge surprise, but as you say, mate, I just really thought, right, let's use this game. There shouldn't be too much fear, mm. because the points aren't at stake. Yeah. And if we go out, we go out. But let's actually, you know, let's take some momentum into that Brentford game. This is this could be key for that. And the way we started the game, re that, that was the key, I think. If we had got the first goal, it might have lifted the crowd and lifted everything. But the way the game went was kind of as expected, which was a shame. Fans were looking for a performance, but also evidence of a plan. And you yeah. sort of alluded to the fact that at half-time, I think we were chatting, you said, well, you know, what plan is there? Based on the stats, I think Burnley at the time had about 66% possession, yeah. which indicates, OK, so... Maybe we're just absorbing and then playing on the break, but then it's. But, but they, he didn't play Dembele. No. And players that can perhaps have the pace to attack on the break. We, yeah. We didn't have that whatsoever. Therefore, the ball was constantly going back to them, and they they absolutely dominated. Well, that's what I mean. If you if you look at Burnley and go, okay, they're good with the ball. We're low on confidence at the moment. We might have to let them have a little bit, and we play in transitions on the counter. I would understand it. But as you say, Dembele wasn't there, which would he would be perfect for a, for a counter-attack. But also the wide men, that was Anthony and Christie, were coming in narrow. Yeah. Um, and then Rothwell, and you thought, OK, he can get close to Slanky there. No, he was dropping deep. So it, it didn't feel like a team that was set up to be counter-attack. But then it didn't look like a team that wanted to keep the ball. Yeah. So it didn't, I'm sure there was some sort of plan, of course, that they've been working on. But there certainly wasn't anything evident um, of a plan. And... And that's what we said before. We've had a lot of performances in the past with different managers and, and different teams where you might not like what you're seeing, but you can normally kind of pick out what he's trying to do, whether you agree with it or not. Yeah. I didn't really understand what we were trying to do. And then obviously going on a bit later, but even at half time when he makes the changes, it felt like it was just make a treble change to make a point mm. because it was just the kind of I'll move Smith to left back. And yeah, I, di I didn't really understand. And I just... Yeah, I kind of wanted to just understand what we were trying to do, really, and how we were trying to hurt Burnley. Mm -hmm. And it, at the end of the day, the, you know, the goal that we got that got us back in the game very momentarily was just from them giving us a goal. Yeah. I mean, so. those two chances, I mean, those two early goals, they basically nullified each other, didn't they, in mm. terms of the individual mistakes. And there were individual errors. And look, we're not going to dissect it minute by minute like we usually do. So I think there's a few themes that we've got out of that game, one of which is talking about Gary O'Neill, another one about the atmosphere at Dean Court as well, but also... The booing of certain players, of course, we know who it is. We'll discuss that later on as well. And, you know, what we're doing as we go into Brentford. But I do just want to pick out these sort of individual mm. mistakes here. And the first mistake that was made was from Senesi. He was trying to play a pass square, but it was intercepted. And effectively, what you've got there, mate, is four on four. But it quickly, as they go through, becomes four on three. Yeah. And... Uh, an easy goal in the end for them to score, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was. It was it was gifted to them, as you say, Sonesi, the culprit this time. Um, but it goes back to that that plan of that was clearly trying to play from the back. But yeah. then you go, but then we're not having any of the ball. We and there's no one... 
Lewis tries to do it at times, but I think Lewis, you know, to his credit sometimes, is quite kind of, he wants to get involved a lot and, and press and run around and, and be quite high tempo. But there's no one, I think it was Andy um, alluded to the fact that I've actually said it previously in the fan cams about how we used to have like a sermon or someone that would come and go to the centre halves, give me the ball, let's play. Yeah. And I think we're struggling with the centre halves at times. I haven't got many options. But they press so well, Bo. They press so really they, well. They, uh, you know, everyone's under immediate pressure as soon yeah. as they make a mistake. Yeah, no, exactly. And then they cut through us. You know, fair play to them. But yeah, it was Senesi this time. It was it was a really poor error. And I think uh, Gary Neil said it after the game. You know, you give give away silly individual mistakes like that. It's going to cost you. And as you say, credit to Burnley because they they took for full advantage of it. And then the second goal that we conceded as well, and that was Lewis Cook. Yeah, like you say, Lewis Cook picking up the ball and you know trying to get between. Two mm. of their attacking players, and in and there you're looking at it, thinking it's four on two at that stage. You got four players more advanced. Yeah. You got two at the back, and you know they absolutely cut us open. Arguably, either you know all three of them could have had a shot. Barnes could have had a shot at this, yeah. uh, but they, where he placed the pass, he could have shot. And then in the end, it was an easy side foot finish. What do you think it is? What why are we making so many individual mistakes? I think confidence is definitely a thing because you know they're not qu they're not quite as as confident and decisive in their decision making because of the fact that the results at the moment and uh, they don't want to make errors and sometimes I always we go back to you know Mepham's a really good example he's having arguably our player of the season so far and he's had a lot of criticism in the past because he gives away silly mistakes yeah. and I often used to say he used to come in and out of the team so much. Mm. That he would be so, you know, worried, and the yeah. pressure was on him because you think oh, I've got to take my chance today, and he'd often make the wrong pass. Um, this one again, that second goal, when Lewis gets the ball again, it screams to me as he gets the ball, he thinks right, let's play out, and he thinks where do I go? Yeah. And then he hovers, and they're on him again, and then they're in, and they worked it really well. To be fair to him, like you say, a lot of them could have shot, and they worked it perfectly. But yeah, again, it was that kind of no one really knew what we were doing from the back, mm. you know, sometimes Travers looked like he was trying to force it long and then other times it was kind of, oh no, we got to play it. I couldn't really, couldn't really get it. And I think sometimes you've just got to in-game, kind of, kind of work out what's, what's going on in, in the game and it was, they were pressing really well mm. and, you know, we just got back into the game and do you kind of go, right, let's get to half-time and let's see what we're going to do and to still kind of play out when that press was so high mm. and cause ourselves our own problems was... Um, yeah, it was a real error in judgment, probably. They, they got the third goal, obviously, but we came out in the second half a different side for about five minutes, yeah. five, maybe ten minutes. And it has to be a mentality thing, because you know, Dom Solanke gets that goal. Really well worked, actually. Mm. Um, Chris did a little ball. Yeah, very him. unlucky with his first. I think he just tried to dink, yeah. keep saved it, and then he just nodded it in. But then after that point, I think, I think Solanke was on the left flank and play, played a dangerous ball yeah. across the box that someone really should have gambled on, but they didn't. But for about five minutes there, mm. we looked good and everyone was in unison. The fans were were loud. The you know, yeah. decibel level was increased. But it's amazing how quickly it changes. Yeah, no, it is. Like you say, we come out and all you want is your free one down. You've got to come out and get an early goal. Mm. Get everyone off their seats a little bit and let's, let's have it. And, and that's exactly what happened. And you kind of thought, oh, I'll tell you what, this could completely swing now. But, but as you said, mate, with that ball across goal from Solanke, that was it felt like that all game that when we were creating things it was from Dom mm. but then he was the one that probably needed to be in there yeah. but he was getting frustrated dropping deep trying to get all of the ball trying to make something happen and and that happened for that chance but but yeah as you say we didn't quite kick on from there we had a the momentum was with us at that point again go back to our thought Bernie managed it well and managed to get a foothold back in the game but yeah that was really where they were there for the killing mm. and um yeah I, I i really thought then this this could completely swear it could be a completely different game but it didn't quite materialize the way i thought it would no it didn't so obviously bernie got the fourth and look you, you there were a couple of errors that led to the fourth one player's getting more stick than others and lloyd kelly we, i think we'll probably come on to that now i mean very lethargic at the back. He looked like he uh, was taking too many touches than he needed. He doesn't instill much tempo from the back. It always yeah. seems to be a pass out wide and then back again, that kind of horseshoe formation. Um, but I think as the, the uh, I wouldn't say the booing at that point in time, but as the negative atmosphere was intensifying, it was clear that Lloyd Kelly was adverse to playing the balls that he usually plays. So what he did, he played a little sort of almost you know, dinked lob to, to Christie, who, I mean, I don't know what he was doing with that, with that header. I, no. thought, I think he was like, you know, trying to cushion it or play yeah. it back. And it was intercepted. And then 
you know, that ball comes through and Lloyd Kelly just looks so lethargic. It's, it's almost like he doesn't realise there's... I mean, there's a player in front of him yeah. who doesn't actually get the ball, who's, who sort of runs across it. But, you know, in between him and I think, was it Senesi? Yeah, I think so. Uh, obviously, the striker nipped in and, and scored the goal. But as a result of that, jeers and boos. Yeah, there were. I, you know, you never want to see that, obviously. And I don't know how much... I, we're in the North Stand, obviously. I didn't, I didn't notice any individual people booing it. I don't know if it was more from the 10 mark, actually. I, I heard people, you know, the guy in front, you know, say Kelly. Yeah. Uh, and there was, you know, there was a lot of it, but I didn't, must admit, I didn't hear any individual boos. No. I've got to say, and that's not me trying to, you know, you know, airbrush what happened, but I, wonder I, you know, if it was, I didn't hear it. No, and I wonder if it was more the 10 mark just because they're closer to Lloyd Kelly mm. because of um, the setup in the second half, maybe. Yeah, probably. But yeah, uh, listen, Celeste made an awful error in the, in, for the first goal. Lewis Cooks was, was really bad, I thought, for the second goal. And this one was was bad. I, I think, but I think the the fact that he's a centre half and it doesn't look like he knows someone's behind him mm. making a run. He almost slows down a goal with fine. Yeah. Was really odd because you have centre half, you should know what's about you. But in the Lloyd, Lloyd Kelly situation as a whole, I, I was talking about it for, to a few people, and it's it's kind of it's weird that they're all um, the people I'm going to allude to here are all left sided centre halves, but different situations. But I remember Harry Maguire at Manchester United getting the captaincy. It really, it really didn't didn't suit him that responsibility at a big club. Tyron Mings at Villa, obviously got kind of stripped is the word. It sounds a bit harsh, but he's he's done better since that. And I do wonder sometimes that responsibility level, and then maybe he's getting a little bit more criticism because you're going, you're our leader, yeah. you're supposed to be. You're our captain. You've come on at half time and you've just killed the game for us in that sense. And to put it black and white, but yeah, I do think. The best spell I've ever seen Lloyd Kelly in a Bournemouth shirt was when he was next to Gary Cahill. He, he must have been given the captaincy for a reason. It was Scott Parker, one that, yeah, there must have been something. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he must be showing something, some kind of leadership in training. But yeah, you know, you're right when he was playing next to Cahill, who's that experienced head. And he might not have had the arm man, but Cahill was leading him. Yeah. And now I think, and that's right, he's had a lot of different partners. He's had, he's had, um, he's probably played with Celeste, he's played with Mepham, he played with Stevens when he come on. So... You know, it's difficult then for him to be kind of the lip. But he never, he never screams leader, does he? No, really it's, doesn't. It's, it's funny, you know, Sunday football's incomparable with uh, obviously what we're watching. I don't know. We were, we were good on Sunday, mate. Um, but you know, when I was playing eleven aside, not so much anymore. But when I used to, I mean, like I was made captain of my team, and I must admit the mindset changed. Yeah, I get it that. really did change because you're almost over aware that you have to lead by example mm. and it does like change the way you play you do play with less freedom and yeah. you do play a bit more safe and Lloyd Kelly style I would say is a bit safe to the extent that it's almost boring um, it's not particularly exciting he doesn't drive forward like players like Chris Mepham sometimes do with the yeah. ball um, Harry Maguire even does it for Man United sometimes even Celestia I think has got that about his game yeah, where he wants he to step in um, but yeah it's it, it's I mean we've said this before this is not just this game it is it baffles me sometimes how many touches he takes mm. on the ball. I've never yeah. seen a centre half do it. He he takes so many touches and he just kind of goes that way, goes and he's just waiting for everyone to be out of and then he can't do anything. Mm. And it is strange. And there were times where I thought when he did it under Parker that I thought, okay, is that an instruction? Is, is Scott saying to him, right, you calm it all down, you get the ball. But he's doing it under a new manager now. Um, so it is a bit odd. But you know, if a team's playing in a counter-attacking style, we need to be moving quickly, mm. and we're not. So we're giving the Bur the uh, you know Burnley team chance to reset, and you know they're pressing high, and we're being forced into mistakes. So it doesn't it doesn't quite tessellate with what Gary O'Neill's plan seems no. to be. No, and uh, yeah, no, no, I totally agree. And it doesn't seem to make any difference if he's going short to his left back or to his centre half, or he's going long. He still takes ten touches before he does it. Um, it's odd going back to the booze and that obviously it was quite clear there were some it's unpleasant it's, it... and um, that shouldn't happen I mean that's that's not going to help anyone um, I think it's weird um, uh, Jake who you know I normally sit next to him I've seen got next to me he made a good point that it's weird isn't it that booing is always the line like booing a player is always like oh that's you've taken it too far yeah. which I agree with but you can swear at someone all game yeah. and it's never a thing and, uh, wh where do we draw the line we, know. You know, we, happily, draw, we happily boo refs and linesman, mm. but you know, I, you know, it's because he's one of our own, isn't it? And I think I put this on YouTube actually in our vlog as as one of the pinned um, comments on there. And I think uh, whilst we should be free to voice our displeasure at the team as a whole, I think obviously manifesting our frustration into booze for an individual, it can have a detrimental effect on a player. And look, we we know that we've had various scapegoats in the past, and they've told us that it does. You know, Chris Meppham. 
I wouldn't say it was like booze on the pitch. That was more social media being tagged on social media and stuff like that. That that pretty much has the same effect because it's targeted abuse and it really doesn't help. Phil Billings had it. Uh, we've had others in the past, like yeah. you know Jordan Ibe and stuff. And you don't know how it mentally affects these players. And you know what it does do is it increases the pressure on Lloyd Kelly so that yeah. when he has got the ball. He's shitting himself. He doesn't want to put a foot wrong, and yeah. it you know it caused him to play less less naturally. Yeah, and I think it's uh, uh, the the key word there is you're a supporter, aren't you? And and as everyone will say, you you, you pay your money, and if you're not if you don't feel like you're getting the application or the performance, then you know you can voice it. I think I mean as we're not the only club. I think every club over time has kind of boo performances and mm. and showed displeasure, but individually, I think that goes too far. I think you take a you take something as a collective, really. If it, if it's bad, it's bad. And yeah, it's frustrating. I do think the the captaincy thing uh, doesn't help him because he you feel like he's got more responsibility and should be getting better. And I, I do. We ne- it's easy to say it in hindsight, but I did think at the time the substitution was odd. Mm. I think Tig said, which is probably right, that maybe it was for fitness. Lloyd's been out for a little bit of time, and maybe kind of just changing the centre half for a centre half at half time, just getting some minutes under his belt, but. I don't think we really need to put him in that situation when things were going as it was. Um, but yeah, I, I, you, you can't, I don't think anyone would really say that. I mean, honestly, like, let us know in the kind of comments and stuff if you think that's, if there's a reason and you think, uh, no, actually, he's our captain, it's okay to criticise him. Yeah. I just don't, I don't see what benefit you're getting from it, really. Um, try and swing on a little bit of a positive. When you said Meps and Billing, they've actually improved since yeah, that, like, which is interesting. Well, but what you do get... Um, is that when you see something like that, then you get a lot of people, which is all I've really seen online, of despite the fact that it was a, it was a bad performance from Lloyd and the team, you get people going, look, we can't do this. Mm. And it wouldn't shock me if the next game Lloyd gets a good reception because you're kind of trying to go, look, that was out of order. It We've seen mod- it in the England team. It, it happens a lot. It just doesn't sit too comfortably. And I'd like to think <clears throat> us as a football club, just yeah. because it's the club I've been going to all my life, is that's very few and far between. I don't see that often. It is a mob mentality yeah. and, you know, I think a lot of, you know, there's one or two people that obviously felt comfortable enough to do it in the first place and then there's the guy next to them that, uh, that sort of thinks to themselves, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And when it builds, I think the Ted Mack was probably culpable, but, um, you know, but we got it. It's a two way thing. Of course. It, and, but, uh, you know, that's not an excuse to boo, but, you know, sometimes the fans need something to feed off. And I've, I've always said this before that I think is. And I'll lead into this later on when we talk about the atmosphere at Dean Court. But I think I think we're poor, you know, as a fan no, no, base. As a fan base, I think, well, you know, we are not the ones to, you know, sort of instigate the um, like tempo. It's the we we always leave it to the players, and when the players do, we feed off it. But we tend to give them nothing. Mm. I've seen fan bases before, like obviously Leeds. I mean, I know that we all hate Leeds, but uh, you know, at three one down they were singing their absolute hearts out and yeah. you know that's that's really going to help the players whereas we you know sit on our hands and we don't make any noise yeah. at all and it's almost like okay players you know do something yeah I, th- I think it's always that case of I mean I was doing it during the game like uh, sat, <coughs> sat by you and you, you, you're seeing yeah we're talking about Lloyd here so you're seeing Lloyd and we're saying about kind of how long it takes him sometimes to play the ball out. and I might go to you I go here we go touch yeah. number five yeah, touch yeah, number yeah. six but Outwardly, you just support them, and then as soon as the whistle goes, if you've supported them all game, and you have you have just got behind them and done done your bit from the crowd, then after the game, you are not happy with what you've just paid to watch, yeah. and you've given you then boom, yeah. but boom, boom as collective because go look, we done our bit, um, but during the game, does it really does it do a lot? I don't think so. As you said, mate, the I've seen more work the opposite way. Yeah. Leeds is a great example. They were behind not doing well at home to a side they should be beating in their opinion and they just kept going and, f- and they probably they thought if this stays like this we'll hammer them after the game yeah. but while it's going on we'll try and help them got over the line and they had a, a great night and set off some fireworks mate yeah, so they were yeah. buzzing yeah. Um, but yeah it was it was a real shame because the game as a whole was poor and we're talking about things like this that um, yeah it's really disappointing and I kind of um, mentioned it earlier but it's not what I see our football club as some people say that look, I'm paying the money, mm. you know, and I can cheer a player, but also I can boo a player. It, you know, it shouldn't work one way, uh, you know. And on Twitter, a lot of people say the same thing in terms of look, I can praise a player, but why all of a sudden can I not be negative about a player? And you know, you can, but I think it's just, it's just the way you do it in like human niceness. For example, right? If I, say like you know Jeff Hayward, 
who plays in a band, yeah. Fractured Group, go and download their latest album. I'm sure it's fantastic. But, you know, Jeff, Chairman Jeff, for the back of the net, he's in a band, you know, say that we're groupies. Yeah. And we go and we go and watch one of his gigs in in Brighton. Yeah. His home turf, right? And he plays a gig and he's you know, like he's the lead singer. He's fucking Ooh. woeful. Yeah. He's you're like, you know, like he has a bad night. And then afterwards he comes up to you and says, How do you think it was? What you know, what you'll say? I'll say Yeah, I want your best. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I want your best. So, you know, I mean like you wouldn't be like oh, Jeff, that was absolute trash. Boom! Yeah, like, yeah. You just wouldn't do and it. And I think man. during it, you might go, if this is really not for me, I'll, pay, I'll go and get a pie, I'll go and stand at the yeah, back. You like, just, yeah. And, it, and it's just about the way, you know, I think a lot of people treat it as pantomime because it is entertainment, therefore they think it's pantomime, therefore yeah. it's acceptable to do it. But in terms of just being a, like a nice human being, I don't I don't think yeah. it's particularly great. And, I, and I, I totally get the, I get the point of, you know, you can cheer them so you can boo them because you've paid the money and all that yeah. stuff. But what I will say is, why are you there? You're there because you want you want to support your team, you want your team to Supporter. win. Cheering a player might might benefit him and you'll go and fact, you know, blah, blah, blah. So only benefits really. You're not going to get a negative connotation from cheering a player. Mm. By booing a player, is that going to help your goal of what you want to see of your team winning? Mm. Is it going to give you, is it going to give what you've paid your money for, is that going to benefit you or the team? It's not. I, I've, you know what, there are two ways and, it, and it's just down to the mentality of the individual when you're being booed you can either try and up your game or you can be like, oh, well, you know, fuck this then. Yeah. And, you know, I can see why, you know, players you know, sometimes yeah. do feel that way. And look, Phil Billing, as we know, like he came out on, on BBC Radio Solent and mm. Chris Temple put the question to him about the booing and, you know, they heard it. They heard it. And it's a, it's a small stadium, so, you know, cool. they can hear it. And I just wonder, like, this kind of links into Gary O'Neill a bit now because it, it's almost like this is his third dawn now, so... Look, he took over the club when Scott Parker was saying all these disparaging remarks. Mm. And, you know, the players obviously, you know, liked Gary O'Neill as a coach and they could be united again under a new manager, albeit in interim. And, you know, they pulled out some good results. That 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 draw at Wolves was good at the time. And then we went and beat Forest, and, you know, that was great. And then, you know, performances did like dip somewhat. Obviously, we saw Southampton, the West Ham game, and the players had to up it again. And so this was the second dawn. This was the Everton games where they had to put in a shift. Yep. And then over the World Cup break, they're being linked with Bielsa. Yeah. And, you know, it's then they're, you know, they're thinking, right, we can have a new manager now. And it, get, it, it then goes back to O'Neill. And then these performances that we've had have been shocking. Is this now another thing that's happening that can make the players maybe unite? Will the players good now point. against Brentford maybe step up to play for Lloyd Kelly? Because yeah, ultimately, point. it's not just Lloyd that's the problem here. Loads of players had uh, yeah. you know, performances that were really bad. But whilst Phil Billing comes out on Radio Sona and says the words to Chris Temple, now can we maybe see them do it on the pitch? Potentially. I think that's a good point. And it, it could be another thing that unites them. Um, We've always done it, and we have backs to the wall mentality of like Ooh. everyone's against us kind of thing. I think that I think the broader point is is what you said is that just just to go back on that individual bo- booing. The broader point is Lord Kelly had a bad game. They all had a bad game, mm. pretty much. But, I mean, you could definitely you might be able to pick out a couple that were okay, but they're all pretty bad. So then to individually boo, I think if one player is so much worse than everyone else, you can kind of make a bit more of a counterpoint. But everyone was pretty bad, um, and yeah, it could unite them. And if they if they have this much kind of uh, respect or, you know, whatever you want to say about Gary O'Neill, then you would certainly fight for him mm. because he's, he's now got the job. Um, yeah, and there has been a few. It has gone like that, hasn't it, with, with Gary. I think, they've, I think they've also got to remember why they... That relief of, of Scott going because of what Scott was saying, not in terms of a manager, but what he was saying about the group. And it felt like they were going, you know what? He's saying we ain't good enough. We'll prove to him we bloody are. Now you ain't here. And they did that. And now it's kind of okay. The fans don't think we're good enough. They don't think yeah. we're going. Let's prove to. That. Do you know what I mean? And um, yeah, listen. We just we just want to see. Applica- I, I I don't want to say there's no application. I don't want to say that because I just think the players are devoid of confidence. I do agree that ideas aren't really there from above them in terms of management. I don't really know what we're doing. But would I say that they're really just thrown in the town? No, mm. no, I wouldn't say that. I don't think they're playing well. I certainly wouldn't just say they don't care anymore. So yeah, I still believe in the group to to fight and give their all against Brentford. It's more the the confidence thing at the moment on the ball and stuff mm. like that. But it could. You're right. It's it's a good point that it could unite them a little bit um, for a massive game because we go and beat Brentford. Everyone will soon forget about about the Burnley game, mate. 
One of the things that I am concerned about with Gary Neal is I, I sort of wonder how many dimensions he's got mm. as a boss. I think, obviously, you know, I've, I've sort of said and alluded to on the, on the end of the vlog that I'm a bit concerned that our really good form, where I think we were the long, we had the longest run of unbeaten games after our massive 9 0 defeat to Liverpool in the Premier League or something. And But obviously, it tailed off pr pretty quickly. And is that a new manager bounce? It, it, it could be, I think. But then you can counter that with the Everton games, but they're so poor mm. that I don't even think that you can include them. So, you know, when there is a sort of new manager bounce, it, you know, it does take like the manager to have like, you know, different like dimensions and do different things. And look, we know that Eddie did things like team bonding exercises. We've seen where they're all down ball with Beach having a walk or they're doing some kind of, um, you know, team mm. bonding exercise in the sea on, you know, kayaks or some shit like that, you know. I've seen on the Arsenal do or no, what's it called? Do, do or die, all or nothing, all or nothing stuff. Sorry, if yeah. Mikel Arteta, where like is you know his team, he's got a team talk, he's got a team talk for the next game, and then he mixes it up by having the club photographer in yeah, to yeah. tell his story. A couple of games later, he like he's got a light bulb in the changing yeah, yeah, yeah. room, and he's saying this is a light. I can't remember the whole yeah, yeah. you know analogy, but he's just kind of mixing up. I can imagine as a ball of player where you're still mentally. I mean, those two games against um, Leeds and Spurs, that, that, that must have mentally battered them. And yes, you've got the Everton games to like, think about, but can you really take that as a positive? Yeah. Yeah, yes, you probably can. But I just wonder, how many dimensions has Gary O'Neill got? How, you know, does he mix up his team talks enough? Like, is it, you know, can he inspire the players to better sometimes? I, I sort of wonder whether he's got that in his locker. Well, the, well, the problem is, we don't know and he doesn't know because he's never done this before. Mm. And, and that's, that's the broader point, isn't it? That... We're in the Premier League. We've got new owners. We've got a bit of bit of mm. backing now, and we've we've obviously given someone an opportunity that has never been through these moments. He's never been through them, um, so he's learning on the job. And to do that in the Premier League is is quite unheard of. And and this was I can't speak on behalf of all mm. fans, obviously, but this was kind of a lot of fears of people I spoke to was kind of one the the relief of of Parker going in terms of what he was saying. For the players, that would have you, you, every week you're getting told you're probably not good enough, and then he leaves. You think, oh, thank God for that. Mm. And Gary Neal's probably come in and gone, look, let's let's prove everyone wrong. Let's mm. have that fighting spirit, and they've done it. And now it's getting to a point we've thrown away a few leads, as you said, leads in Tottenham. And right, we need we need you now, Gaffer. What what are we doing? What's the new plan? What what you know? How are we going to address this? And he's learning. He's learning what to do. He hasn't. He's barely done any team talks in his life, and that's. That's that's the as I say, mate. That's the broader point of of why he was appointed. From Gary's point of view, how can he turn it down? Mm. I mean, he can't turn it down. He's got no, he's never been a manager, and he's got an opportunity to manage a Premier League club. It's, I mean, he can't turn it down. Mm. I kind of feel sorry for for Gaz because should should this really be his first job? I mean, mm. not in my opinion. I think he's a perfect interim manager, absolutely perfect. And as we've a lot of us have said after the Everton game, it was thank you very much. That's mm. why he got the reception yeah. he got. Um, thank you so much for coming in, steadying the ship after Scott was making it quite a toxic place. Mm. You've come in, thank you so much. Hopefully you stay with us in a coaching role. Mm. Cheers, get the new gaffer and let's go on from here. So, yeah, and I think that just goes into the point again, mate. I, I, I just can't believe we've gone down this road and now we're in a position where Foley and, and people upstairs are probably thinking, ah, this yeah. is a bit trickier than I thought. It's interesting when you sort of mention Scott Parker. Oh, by the way, how did he do in his first game, by the way? For Well, Club Bruges yeah. played Genk. Who have, um, they've beaten Genk in five, the last five times okay. they played him. Lost 3 well. But you know what? Like Scott Parker, like, it, it, it was even getting quite... The league. It was getting quite toxic towards the end of Scott Parker. Like, even in the championship. And yeah. I remember doing a free-for-all where someone walked past and said, Parker out. Um but one thing that was really interesting was some of the kind of videos that they did behind the scenes where the Help players mm. the players like visibly still bought into it. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, you saw that what happened behind the scenes as well with the half time video that was released and at that point people were like, Oh my god, Scott Parker. He's all right, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. It's mad. It's yeah. just that like, we don't really know much about Gary Neal. No, of course. You, you sort of you sort of wonder like lazy phrases are, are often used, like lost the dressing room, but you sort of wonder whether he has or not, I don't know. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to be a th that great an environment at the moment. I mean, like, like you know, Lloyd Kelly just went straight out of the main entrance and like to his car, didn't right. didn't stop for any photos and stuff. Which, but I don't blame them. It's it's 
it's kind of understandable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and I think it goes goes back again as these players in terms of you're saying about Scott Parker and that they've got no previous on Gary Neal, so they don't know what he's about. And mm. you know, you you get the difficult times on the Scott. I'm not being funny. If I was a player, I'd think, yeah, but he's been in the championship before and he's got a mm. team out. Yeah. So let's let's keep listening to him because he knows how to get us out. And it goes to the point again. You're, you're right. Um, there was a lot of performances last season in the championship. Where I thought, God, this is dire. Trash. This is awful. But we were getting results. Yeah. And we were on course to go up, which we did. And I've always said that if there's, you know, obviously Eddie in the Premier League before, there were times we get absolutely slapped. But you thought we're having a real go is brave, and it's yeah disappointing. But I can respect the application and the game plan. And then on the Scott, it was really bad, but you go, got the result. At the moment, it's really bad to watch and results. Yeah. So it's a bad combination. But yeah, I think then players in there maybe are starting to think, Does, can Gary do this? He's never done this before. Can yeah. he do this? I, I mean, I really hope he, he can, because if he proves us all wrong, then we stay in the Premier League. Do you, do you think there's a stubbornness from O'Neill? Like, one, I mean, fa- you know, fans are stubborn. And mm. There have been people that have backed Gary O'Neill from the start. They were very yeah. stubborn and staunch in their views, and they're not willing to even like talk about the fact that they might be wrong. Yeah. Um, and you know that that also works the other way around as well. But it, in terms of things like Lloyd Kelly having the captaincy, I, it's clear that it's weighing him down. But it's almost a thing that he's probably stubbornly digging his heels in and thinking, "Oh, you know, like, I need to be right about this." Yeah, no, probably. Um, and yeah, and it was. I think Gary probably gets what the, he wasn't like he named him the captain. He was already um, the captain, which which probably helps. Um, but yeah, I think it is. It is. It's a difficult time, and and that's that's the worry I think from a from a fan base is is kind of in the past when when Scott had his problems, you thought if yeah, he's been there and done it, he, he'll he'll know what to do to get us out. He, we haven't got that been there and done that kind of feeling with with Gaz, and and now and now everything you pick up on so. I think he made a comment that he, he probably really regretted about Fulham struggling as well at the moment. Oh yeah, so what? They're seventh. What, when, did he, when did he mention this? Was this after the after the game? game? Yeah, and it was kind of about how. Is that what he said? Yeah, how about the fellow promoter teams not in Forest Fulham and struggling? Yeah, not in Forest and Fulham are struggling as well because they're the new and they're going to Europe at the moment. Mm-hmm. So he probably regrets that. It was probably you know he didn't think too much for it. But when results aren't going your way, fans are going to pick up on these sort of things. Um, did you get the did you get some Parker esque vibes from the way he was the, spinning it? Yeah, that's the know, worry. And you, yeah, and listen, the, the the black and white side of it is that when you ain't getting results, you're going to pick up on these things and yeah. you're going to start going, "What's he going on about?" I mean, that was a, a really weird. And then obviously Billing coming out, as you said, um, kind of you know saying, you know, we can hear what the fans are saying. This ain't helpful. When well, it was only a week ago that Gary O'Neill said it doesn't matter what the crowd say so how come you're now yeah, yeah so so these sort of things when results aren't going your way they get picked up on if you're winning football matches you don't take as much interest in the, in the press conferences you really don't mm. because you're winning football matches when you start losing i think as a fan i certainly do you start joining in and go what's his actually what's he saying yeah. is he and that's the problem at the moment and um, it's very difficult because he just comes out after these games and, and the crowd's a bit toxic and we're on a bad run and it's what can he say but he certainly didn't say the right things after this one. No. So so we can't help what happens on the pitch, but we can help to give the players some impetus by yep. getting behind the side. What has happened to the North Stand? Yeah, I know. Uh, not just the North Stand, it's like on away games as well. I know that we talked about the amount of Man United fans in yeah. in the crowd at Chelsea weren't particularly good, but I don't know what it is. We, we, like the atmosphere is really poor and chat to Tiggs about this and he, he sort of said, look, you know, a lot of the people that have been in the North Stand, you know, got their seats in whatever it was, 2001 when the stadium opened, they've probably been in the same seats ever since and they've been slowly filled by new season ticket holders who are getting older um, and as a result, you know, you can't get a season ticket these days throughout the stadium but, you know, there are some diehards that have to now get tickets match to match. They're in the Tad McDougall stand, so they're the ones that are sort of making the noise. They're the sort of new breed of fans. Mm. And, and I don't, you know, like there are some fans who are in later years of their lives that are watching in the Ted Mac, but there's a lot of younger supporters yeah. as well that just physically can't get a season ticket who we would ideally love to have in the North Stand. And yeah. this all comes down to our like stadium, doesn't it, and our facilities and the fact that if we got a new ground, it would be bigger and there would be a chance to pile 
these quite large numbers of you know vocal and vociferous fans together but at the moment it just seems to be so separated and in, and in the north stand at the moment i'm finding it like sometimes you join in with a chant and it's almost like you feel embarrassed to do so because yeah, no one else around so you sing it and you feel as though they're almost looking at you and judging you and yeah. that's you know probably on my part paranoia but it feels like there's obviously there's the left side and there's like a bit on the right as well yeah but it's only ever when the team does well when we're all in unison. Yeah. Wouldn't it be good that we could have a whole stand of people that are willing to get behind the boys yeah. throughout the game, you know, whatever the conditions? Yeah, no, of course. And I totally agree. And it's the same on away games recently. Uh, it was a loss at Man U and Chelsea. Um, both very similar in the sense that I thought, God, it's normally rocking on the away day. And it, it really hasn't been. It's hard. You're just kind of guessing at, at why that reason is. I think you made a few a few good points there of probably why it is. I also do think it's obviously I, I go to it again. I can't speak on behalf of everyone. I just try and try to think of reasons. And I think that there's definitely been everyone I've spoke to, and that's a lot of Bournemouth fans. This feeling of we thought we were saying goodbye to Gaz. We didn't expect this. We thought we'd get him back, and it almost feels a little bit like it's. We're so we're fed up that the club have done it again. Yeah. In terms of the appointment, that it is kind of like, and then we concede, and it's kind of like, yeah, and, uh, it's cool. and it's and it is almost like stubbornness of why should I? Yeah. Because you've done it again. Because the fact of the matter is, mate, whoever is, and we've got new owners now, so it'll be interesting how we do going forward. Whoever the actual person is, or the people are making the decisions, that when they've had to make a decision, obviously after Eddie left, we've appointed an assistant manager, a failed manager a relegated manager and not a manager manager. Mm. <laughs> That's what we've done. And, and I do feel a little bit in the crowd, it feels a lot of resignation there from everyone kind of like, I'm fed up of keep that yeah. because I'm just really fed up of what this happened again. And it's been, since the break, it's been, they, I think everyone is a little bit, it shouldn't be with the facts I've just mentioned, but I was definitely a little bit shocked. Yeah. And when we were on the, do you remember when I went on the overlap? And they were asking me, do you think Gaz will get the job? And they were all kind of going, well, surely he's get the job. I'll go, surely they won't do it again. Yeah. And I was kind of saying, I'm, I'll be shocked. You did say that, yeah. Because I can't, they've been burnt too many times. They ain't going to just give it to Gary O'Neill. And I do feel sometimes, it's just my opinion, that the crowd are a little bit fed up and they want to see some more proactiveness from upstairs. Yeah. Um, and it's just that kind of resignation that's really hard to get the energy to get behind what we're seeing and, and what we're feeling at the moment. But it could soon change. That, that's that's the life football fan. We get an early goal against Brentford. We get a few it's, silence it's hope, in before yeah. the it's game. Hope, and it, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think if you're a genuine fan, you want you want to be proved wrong, and you want Gary Neal to prove us all wrong. Because if he proves us all wrong, we we'll stay in the Premier League. So that's my hope, mate. Is yeah, we get a new manager in. But I would love us to just turn it round, and you and I want to go. Tell you what, Gaz sort it out, and we're fine. I'd love that. Yeah. Because it stops any sort of you know loads of changes again, and and Gary can end up being a good manager. At this moment in time, it's hard to see that. But who knows, football can change really quickly. I don't, want to, I don't want to bring you back down to earth, mate, but mm. we haven't won a televised match this season. We've mm. only won 3 pm kickoffs. We've got a 5 30 match on Sky Sports against Brentford, mate. We've got a lot of 5 30s coming up. It doesn't bode well, does it? No, it doesn't. And um, they're bloody good at home. I sort of <laughs> said, though, on, on, um, on YouTube, like in the comments, I sort of said that this could be. The match that turns it, look, we can, yep. I said we can, we, like when we lose, we, you know, let's moan and let's bicker and lose our shit for a few days. But then we need to use that emotion as a, as a real positive next week and, you know, properly go for it when we go to the new Brentford Stadium and help the, Roy, help the boys raise their levels. I think that, um, mm. you know, sometimes we produce these results when we least expect it. Exactly. And... Maybe, maybe this could be the one. You know, like Brentford, oh, I'm not going to say they're going to be complacent because I think that Thomas Frank's an excellent manager and he'll probably get them up for it. However, I do think that sometimes, uh, you know, they they have got a poor performance or an off performance in their locker, and we've got a good performance. It just needs to be one of those days. Mm. And it's a London away day. Who doesn't love a London away day? Maybe this is the one, mate. Maybe, and they, you know, this could kickstart it ahead of some fixtures ahead of us that are horrible. <laughs> Horrible yet winnable. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The more recent because yeah. we've got Forest coming yeah, up. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah. And we can, and you can spin it, mate. I mean, as you say, Brentford look good at home. We look really poor. This will be a, the banker of the weekend. Anyone doing a little coupon, they'll be yeah. putting putting Brentford down to win. Having said that, the games we've lost 
recently. Southampton, I think they won in the league one in 13 mm. against us. West Ham won in nine or 10 against us. Yeah. Chelsea won in eight or nine against us. So the teams that are actually off form are beating us. Yeah. So, all right, let's play someone on form then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because I think if we were playing a team that were down in the mud off form, we'd be going, oh, they'll pick up here. Yeah. So, you know, who knows? Who knows, mate? And it, it would be typical us, I think. Um, you know, Newcastle were flying when we went there. They only thought we'd never going to beat Newcastle. But, uh, and we managed to get a really good point there. And then the one uh, after that massive unbeaten run we had under Gary after the Liverpool game, the one we lost was Southampton at home, which was on paper the best game. Yeah. So it's football. And, and as you say, mate, Brentford look good. But they're, they're, they are, no disrespect, they're, they're Brentford. They're, they're obviously, you can beat Brentford. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, who knows? And it is that back to the wall thing. And, if we can defend well and, and, and do some bits, we've, we've got good players. Mm. We've, we have got good players and, and we're the type of team, in my opinion, we've shown it in the past. We can go to Brentford, we nick a goal, we can be resolute. We've shown that in the past. We haven't done it lately, but we have done it in the past. It's got to change at some point. So I'm certainly not saying writing it off yeah. um, because stranger things have happened, but um, totally understandable why Brentford would be massive favourites. Yeah. Um, but you never know, mate. You never know. And, and it only takes, you know, we might get a few... A few Bodies through the through the door yeah, in true, transfer, true, true. and it just it just lifts the place a little bit. I do think the players need that. I think we will do it, and I do think sometimes I've seen a lot of ex players in on you know on podcasts things like that saying that when you get a new player and sometimes when you're on a bad run, it can lift you because you're going right. Who's this? Who's this? And I know, can he fit into us? And it lifts you as a group. So yeah, a few things like that might happen, mate. And um, yeah, and as you say, even the Kelly thing and stuff, it might unite them a little bit. Again, I don't know whether I feel better or worse after this, but um, it, you know, it's clear that we need to get behind the lad. So mm. any any sort of emotion that you have, just use it in a positive way at Brentford, and let's get behind the boys because we, you know, we know what we can do for the players. And look, maybe maybe that's what they need for once. They always are the team that, um, or the boys that inspire us as fans. Why not try it the other way around this time? And uh, maybe we can. You know, be as good as Leeds are. I shouldn't have said that. But no, but but you know what? It's it's so important. You know that we do stay united at the moment, and that you know there are some major cracks showing at the moment. I think most of it's geared around like around the appointment of Gary Neal, not necessarily O'Neill himself. No, because not, not, I think I I think I mentioned it very briefly that. How can you not take the job? Of course you would. Of course you're going to take the job. All I of mean, us you'd would. take it. I mean, I, I would never... I mean, I would. the last thing I'd do is appoint someone else that's got no experience. But if they ran me up and gave me the job, I'm not going to go, oh, no, because I don't believe in that. I'm yeah, going to take yeah. the opportunity. So, are. I just... Yeah, I just feel like he's been thrown into the deep end. It's probably a good good expression. But, yeah, Gar- Gary's come across pretty well. We've gone over the things that he's done since Scott left. So, And I actually think... Thinking about it now, is it quite a good game in the sense that it's a new stadium for everyone? Yeah. Because uh, obviously we haven't been to Bournemouth and played at this stadium against Brentford. Nice little trip. I think we'll, we'll, we'll so, we've sold it out. It's a really good one for everyone to be quite, you know, yeah. in good spirits and let's just get, get the way and bounce in and who knows, it could be, a, could be a special away game, mate. Let's hope so. I think the numbers actually, I think it's just short of two, it's on 1,700. Yeah. That would dictate that the regulars yeah, probably, will, yeah. will be the, the ones that have got those tickets. Yeah, so. yeah true. Hopefully we can create a decent atmosphere. Look, there will be a preview, of course, later on in the week. Let us know what you think um, ahead of that fixture. And, um, you know, sometime last year I talked about big news for the channel. Stay tuned. Are the cherries? And, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Nope, cheers. You lit. Have I been sacked? (laughs) It's a big news.